Wow. So got a lot of people filtering in. It's fine because, like it's I said, time. I'm. It's good. Yeah, I'd rather let people settle down. Oh, of course, the little ones I introduce you. Yeah, let me let me let me let me let There's still uh, seats up front if folks want to see. All right, it's exactly 2 p.m. in Athens. So welcome to the next talk. This is Room Elisos, and uh, let me introduce Grant McAllister from, from Amazon. He's a senior principal engineer at Microsoft. Uh, Amazon, oh, yeah. at Amazon, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I is going to tell us about practical memory tuning for Postgres. Cool. Welcome, Grant. Thank you. So obviously uh, we were we you know we support Postgres at uh, with both RDS and Aurora, but this talk is really just a you know generic talk about Postgres. And really it's about, you know, we're not gonna dive into the super internals. What we're gonna try to do is just give you a good roadmap for you to think about how memory you is used in Postgres and why you care. So let's start off right off the bat with like why would you care? So just to demonstrate this. I have a sysbench read only point select workload, right? So fairly simple. It's all in memory to start with. And the vertical axis is TPS. So you want that to be higher. So the green line is like a normally tuned Postgres instance, you know, and that's kind of like what you'd get out of the box with like an RDS or Aurora, right? Um, the red line is if you don't have a good, well tuned memory system, right? And what you see is a dramatic difference in the performance, right? So this is an 11x reduction in your throughput on the badly tuned system, right? So this is why you care, because that's not great. So just to illustrate a few things we're seeing here on this graph, um, the first one is that you no longer have enough buffers in memory to hold all your data. So you're reading from storage, right? So that's going to slow you down a lot. Um, you see these points down here where we drop down to almost zero TPS. And that's where we've pushed the box so hard that it's actually swapping and thrashing, right? Um, so that's really bad. And this is still actually okay because the OOM killer is actually not actually engaged. How many people know what the OOM killer is? Pretty much everybody. It's the out of memory killer, right? It's the thing that you don't want to have happen. So this example is still one that the database kept running the whole time. So it's better than it crashing, but still not good, right? So let's talk a little bit more about OOM and swap. So let's say I have four Postgres processes. And if the blue size of the box is representing how much memory they're using, right? If we run out of memory, which process do you think it's going to get killed? You think four, right? Nope. It's going to be number three. And you know why it's number three? Is because the badness for a task is not only the size of the memory, it's how long it's been around for. So if you have something that's using quite a bit of RAM, but it's new, that's the one the OOM killer is most likely to kill. But it doesn't really matter because in Postgres, the problem is if any of them get killed, there's a chance that it's in a section that's going to cause the whole database to have to crash and restart, right? And this is why you don't want OOM killer running because one, it's probably going to kill the task that you cared about because it's the recent one. So it's probably something that's actually actively doing something for your users. But second, it's probably going to cause your whole database to go down and have to be restarted, right? So you definitely want to avoid having the OOM killer happen. The way to do that is not to run out of memory, right? Which sounds easy, and we'll talk about how to, how to make that happen. So swap is kind of a controversial thing. Like even inside of like the group I work with, some people still just don't think swap's a useful idea. I think it is if it's used correctly. Um, so you know, if you ask for 8K of RAM, shown in the red there, you're basically going to, you know, four, two 4K chunks going to need to be filled. You've got space where those little black spots are. You can use that portion of RAM, right? This is great. 
But once the RAM's full, if you ask for 16K pages, the Oom Killer is going to kick in and probably kill your Postgres process, right? So that's not great. So to give yourself a little more time to actually try to manage the memory, you can do swap. And then what's going to happen is it's going to push that data out of RAM into swap, which is obviously going to take a little bit of time. And then those requests are actually going to be fulfilled via RAM. So this works quite well. And this is the swap out portion, right? Now the challenge comes is if you're doing too much of this, because if you're swapping things out, at some point that RAM, those items that are over in the swap, those you know green boxes need to come back in, right? So that's swapping back in. And if you're constantly swapping stuff in and out, then you're essentially gonna be just thrashing, right? So it's okay to have a little bit of swap and to use it just to kind of give you a chance, more chance for whatever process that's putting a high demand on your system to finish. But if you're in a constant high demand situation where you're basically pushing stuff in and out, then swap's not actually going to be useful for you, right? Because your performance, again, is going to get tanked. So if I had, let's say, a 64 gig system, I'm not going to have 64 gig of swap. I might have two or four gig of swap because if I'm swapping more than a couple gig out, I'm probably already in a situation where things are gone horribly wrong, right? So I think swap's useful. We we use it in our system, but you know your mileage vary depending on what your what your issues are. So let's talk a little bit more about how Postgres sort of uses memory and what a normal Postgres system looks like. So obviously you have the whole box with all your memory. Your operating system is gonna take some room in your RAM, right? Typically for a lot of setups, your shared buffers is gonna consume some portion of your RAM, like for RDS it's 25%. You know, that may vary depending on your specific setup, but it's usually not a very large amount of the RAM. Uh, the Postgres process is every time you instantiate a new Postgres process, it's going to use some RAM. Um, so you got some space for that. And let's talk about the elephant in the room. Not that elephant, the other elephant, the page cache. This is the thing that kind of distinguishes Postgres from every other database I've ever used in that it, has a, it uses the page cache as a secondary cache. And this has a lot of benefits, but it also has a lot of challenges that we'll get into in a second. Other databases, including for our modified version of Postgres Aurora, we don't actually use the page cache because we don't actually have a file system. But other databases like Oracle or MySQL don't also don't use the page cache for, I mean, you still have a page cache on your system, as you'll see in that diagram, but you're not using it to cache your shared buffers, right? Um, so in this case, you probably end up with a shared buffers that's much larger, like 75%. And we'll talk about why that is there's some advantages to that and some disadvantages. So. The reason why the page cache is very challenging is that it holds a lot of different stuff. So, you know, when you want to read something for the database, first you look in shared buffers. If it's not there, it's going to go look in the file system cache. If it's there, it just returns. And if not, it's going to go read from storage through the file system cache and back to shared buffers, right? So obviously shared buffers, some of that is going to be duplicated in the file system cache. Uh, when you do wall, archiving, all those things, they also end up using the file system cache. So you see how you've got like various things using up your file system cache, and it's very hard to tell what is using your file system cache. Now, let's say the miscellaneous use of your file system cache, someone's got a, some application running that's touching a lot of files that isn't your Postgres process, and it uses up more RAM. Did you see that the amount of stuff that's shared buffers got smaller, right? So that may have like now impacted how much reading you're going to have to do from disk. So this is kind of hard, you know, to tune because if you do other things on your system, it will have an effect on your file system cache. So when we talk about memory, one of the things that you want to do to get good performance is you want the most important things in memory, right? And that really comes down to working set size. So you have a whole bunch of data, like in this case, I have a table of orders, right? and it's 800 gig. So the naive thing is that your working set size is 800 gig, but not, not in actuality, right? Because for most applications, they're not gonna scan all the old orders, right? It's the frequently accessed stuff here. So it's probably the recent orders in the last 18 months where people are saying, you know, where's my stuff? Creating new orders, that kind of thing, right? But different applications have different patterns. So, you know, this one might have 80 to 100 gig as a working set size out of 800, right? And I'm just making a number up. It could be smaller or bigger, right? But let's say I have an inventory system for each airport, right? And in that case, the heat map is probably going to be different because there's going to be some things in the inventory 
of each of these airports for spare parts that's going to be hot and there's going to be some that are almost never used right so you know how the heat maps to the to your table is kind of a thing that you kind of have to know from an application basis to kind of understand if the working set size is let's say two or three times larger now on this table than you might have expected right so it's good to kind of figure out for your data you know what is the important stuff to cache right what is going to be used by you know your application and some of that is also comes down to randomness right so when you look at your working set size if you've got random data and so in this case let's say you've got a GUID as a primary key instead of a sequence right what's going to happen is you're accessing those GUIDs they're going to be kind of random possibly so you know, you do a read and you're going to touch those blocks that are sort of in blue. We're starting to warm those up. And then we, you know, ask for another block. We're going to go to a different part of the tree and a different part of the heap. And you can see over time that the only thing that's going to be really super hot in this is that leaf or is that root node on the bee tree, right? So in actuality, the most important thing to cache on this kind of database is probably that, you know, that root node, right? Because the other ones might only be accessed once or twice a day. Maybe that's fine from a latency perspective not to actually have those in cache, right? On the other hand, let's say you have a right-leaning kind of style of tree, and a sequence is a good example of that, or date-based, right? So if you're inserting with dates, they're all going to be over on the one side of a tree. And so as you're working down this, you're hitting the same blocks over and over again, right? So then it's really important to have those set of blocks in cache so that your performance is good. You're also probably going to have less blocks that you need to cache, which means this is probably going to have a smaller working set size because of not being random. And generally, when it comes to working set size, randomness is your enemy, right? Like trying to keep things from being random, it means that somewhat you spread load out, but in a lot of cases, you just end up using a lot more memory to do the same application. So let's talk a little bit more about shared buffers and you know how to think about setting that size. So if you have a small amount of shared buffers, it's going to be super hot, super effective. And then your file system cache is going to have probably some hot data that doesn't fit in shared buffers. And then sort of gradually, some of it's going to be colder, right? And got your storage. That's always cold. It's going to read from that, right? So this is how a lot of Postgres systems are set up, including RDS. And this works quite well. But just to kind of walk you through why having to go to the file system cache costs you more, uh, I have another benchmark. So this again, read-only point select. Vertical axis on the left there is TPS. So again, higher is better. And on the other side, it's the percentage of, these, of the two objects, like the table and indexes, that fit into the shared buffers. Now, for this workload, everything fits into RAM. So what we're talking about here is whether it fits into shared buffers or is in the file system cache, right? So at the far left, I start out with 25% of the host memory set for shared buffers, i.e. sort of like my normal default. And I have these 80 tables. And what you can see is we're getting really good performance, almost 850,000 TPS. All the tables, all the indexes fit in shared buffers. Nothing has to come from the file system cache, right? When I basically go 50% larger, a little more than 50% larger on the working set size by increasing the number of tables. Now, everything's still in RAM, but not everything fits in shared buffers. So you can see that the index is still completely in shared buffers, and the tables have started to fall out, right? Because again, they're accessed a little less frequently. And notice how that performance drop already, right? And this is just that extra hop to go get something from the file system cache. When you go again and double that size again, we start to see a bigger drop, right, on performance. And now the tables are only sort of in the 25, 30% in the cache, right? So this is infecting your latency. Double again by re removing, basically making my shared buffers 12.5%, right? So I made shared buffer smaller, still, still big table. And what we see is that now the indexes don't fit in. But the thing about indexes is again, the leaf nodes are not as important. So we're still getting pretty good performance, right? But as we keep pushing the size of the working set up and the size of the shared buffers down, it reduces the performance, right? And this last one, where we only have 1% of the host memory set for shared buffers, right? So this is quite small, it's 1 25th of the starting point. Essentially, none of the table is in shared buffers and very little of the indexes. And we're only getting 60% of the performance 
that we were getting when everything was in shared buffers. So what this tells us is that for at least our really frequently accessed stuff, we want shared buffers to be large enough for that. Otherwise, you're paying an overhead on the CPU and it's going to impact your performance. So just to show you kind of what the distribution looks like, how many folks are familiar with PG buffer cache? So it's a really nice um, view that you can load that as an extension that um, that gives you information about things like usage count. You can also figure out like where, like what buffers for what table are in there. Uh, it is a bit expensive to run, but you know it's it's very useful. So here I've got the two different. I've got the indexes and the tables broken up, um, and the usage count. So five being the hottest and zero being basically not right. Um, and the way Postgres works is it, you know, decrements this with clock sweep algorithm. So it's constantly trying to move things from five down to zero so that it can make space, right? Um, what we see on the index here is that we have a lot of stuff in five. And this is great because this means things like the root nodes and the first level of our B tree is in cache, right? And this is the thing that's going to be hit like constantly over and over again, right? And then as you get further down into the leaf nodes, some of those are probably in that zero, one, and two level of heat, right? Um, so they're cached, but not completely, right? Um, but with 1%, we see that only almost nothing is being you know, heavily cached. So it's gonna be forced out very easily. And so there's gonna be a lot of you know, blocks coming in and out of, out of the cache, right? And on the table, what we see is sort of the opposite thing because again, a heap being random means that you're gonna have a wide spread, right? So here we see that almost everything is in the zero because it's not as frequently accessed as the index. And again, this really tells you that you wanna make sure your indexes are in shared buffers. Your heap is good to be in shared buffers, but if it's not, it's kind of fine to be in the file system cache, right? So then why not run like this, right? Why not run huge, big shared buffers um, and a tiny file system cache, right? Well, the challenge right now for Postgres is that um, if the database, if your Postgres processes crash, then your shared buffers go away with it. So that means you start back off with a cold cache, right? And you have to load that from the file system cache, which you made quite small, which means most likely you actually have to load from storage, right? So you're gonna have like a, a pretty big interruption possibly to your service while you warm the cache up while your performance is, is slower, right? Um, so for, for Aurora, for example, we, we solved this because of the changes we made to the engine. So we are survives the crashing of Postgres. But I'll say that like, that's very complex and a very scary thing to do because if you don't do it correctly, you end up with uh, some very bad things happening. So yeah, so it'll warm back up over time, but it definitely will take you some time to get back to, back to a good state. So how many people are familiar with huge pages? Pretty much everybody, but I don't have people like so it's a typical setup now for most people to have their system configured with huge pages. But I know a lot of people are now using containers and other things where they may not be configuring huge pages. So I wanted to cover why it's important for memory utilization on your system. So if we've got our three Postgres processes over on the left in the blue, um, and we have our shared buffers on the right, for that Postgres process to, you know, to basically to be able to read that, it needs a map. And that's what the page table is. So when you go do this, if you don't have huge pages set, every time you go and touch a 4K page, you need an entry in the page table for your process, right? So the next you know, page you look at, you need another page table entry. If another process goes and looks at the same page, it needs its own page table entry, right? Now, if you do a two meg share, if you're using huge pages, then you only need one entry for that two meg, right? So it's, 512 times more efficient from the amount of page table entries you need if you're using huge pages, right? Um, so this is sort of the key that I that it confuses people a lot. They think it's the size of the shared buffers times the amount of processes, but it's not. It's the number of blocks each process touches in the shared buffers. So if each one of your processes only touches one block, then if you have like a thousand blocks, it's just a thousand page table entries, right? But if each process touches 10,000 blocks and you have 10,000, you know, then you have millions of page table entries, right? So to demonstrate that, 
we'll show some benchmarks here, right? So again, point selects, I've got 160 gig working set size on an R6i extra large. So this fits in RAM just fine. The green line is running with huge pages on and the pink line is without. And what you'll notice is there's a little bit of degradation because there is a slight more overhead to have to have all those page table entries, right? And to do that translation, you get some TLB misses and some other stuff. But in, but in general, you know, you'd be pretty happy with that performance in the pink, right? But let's go and double the number of clients. So instead of 250 clients, we now have 500 clients. And what you notice is without huge pages off in the pink, I'm getting all kinds of horrible performance. And this is because I'm using a lot of RAM for my page table entries and it's pushing blocks out of cache, right? Because I don't have enough memory. So this is bad, but not horrific. Um, but this, this, this will look familiar because it's off of the opening slide, right? So this is when you go up to a thousand clients. Now you need a lot more RAM and it totally destroyed this system, right? By not having huge pages on. So if you run a small system with not a lot of RAM and not a lot of clients, then huge pages is probably not a big deal in a container, right? But if you start to get containers that are larger and you're starting to run with a lot of process and a lot of RAM, this can be a serious issue. So here's sort of the summary on that. So as we increase the number of users, this is not the size of the shared buffers. This is the size of the page tables. So what you can see is that when I went up to a thousand clients with this size, with shared buffer set to 25% of RAM, I was using almost 45% of the RAM just for page table entries. So I was actually using more RAM to map to the shared buffers than the shared buffers were themselves, right? And so this is why huge pages is really critical if you're gonna run a larger uh, Postgres database. So let's talk a bit about sort of shared buffers is like one of the cluster-wide parameters, but there are some others. Um, and actually a lot of these have been introduced recently with 17. Um, and this is really good because a lot of these used to be fixed values. And I'm not gonna go into really any detail on them, but just to say that they are cluster-wide. So you know you don't have to worry about these if you just set them to a reasonable value. But you do have to understand that they will be in addition to sort of what was allocated and in general may allocate a bit more in PG-17 than in 16, right? So, um, and just as a note, like, as I note on the max prepare transactions, please don't use XA. It's never, not a good thing. You're going you're gonna to have more problems than just memory tuning if you use that. But um, So, mostly shared buffers is the main one on a system level that you have to think about. But on the session level, there's a there's a few as well. So temp buffers is sort of the equivalent of shared buffers. So shared buffers is the caching for regular tables, the blocks. So it's a global that works across the whole system, right? Um, temp tables, of course, are local. So the temp buffers that you get are session local, right? So each session that you have that does this, you will use up whatever you set to temp buffers, right? And Logical decoding work mem is also sort of session level. Um, and I say session level, it's kind of an odd session one. So when you want to do logical decoding, you need a logical decoding slot. And so each logical decoding slot is going to use that much logical decoding work mem. So it is per session, but it's a session that's doing logical decoding. So if we add a second decoding slot, then we're using two times the logical decoding work mem. So you just have to remember, you know, if you've got two, it's probably not a problem. If you've got 30, this becomes a fairly expensive thing, right? So if someone just keeps adding slots and things on your database, it could end up being a problem for you. Now let's talk about per session and operation. So this is one of the more confusing sections from a memory, you know, that folks think are per session but aren't. So work mem, when I started with Postgres, I was like, oh, this is per session, right? Yeah, that seems reasonable. Like it's my work mem for the whole session, right? So here I set my work mem to one gig. And I'm going to do an explain on this query, this select query. And um, it's just basically doing a bunch of sorting, right? So I just wanted to do a, a generated series to do some sorting. And what this did was it sorted four gig to disk because the that's how big the query needed, right? because my data size is 3.8 gig. So if I had to sort the whole thing, right, that's gonna end up being roughly almost four gig. So this took nine seconds to run. Um, and on this chart, what I'm gonna show you is 
how much memory I used and for how long. So this took, like I said, nine seconds. So I was using basically that one gig of work mem pretty much for most of that, that time, right? So someone's probably gonna say, well, that's not great performance. Let's see if we can get this to sort all in RAM, right? So what we're gonna do is change our work mem to four meg. And because my, you know, my table is still 3.8, it sorts all in memory. This is great, right? And we reduce the time down to 3.8 seconds. So it's a good improvement, right? But when you think about it, what you're doing is you're sort of trading off using more RAM for shorter periods, but that can cause some spikiness, right? So in general, it might be a reasonable trade-off, but you kind of have to understand your system. But this is where it gets interesting. So I changed my query. So now I have two tables I'm joining and I'm sorting inside on those subselects and outside, right? So I've got my work where I'm set to four gig again, and I've got two 3.8 gig tables sort of generated inside. So what happens is, is I actually use four gig for the one sort, and then I use four gig for the next sort. And then I have a little bit extra for sorting the old, the results, right? So this took seven and a half seconds. And this is what it looks like from a time memory perspective, right? So even though I set my work mem to four gig, I'm now using eight and a half gig of RAM, right? So this is where you can really get into some surprises where you think, oh, well, I haven't set work mem too large, but if you have a lot of nesting of operations that need work mem, you can use a tremendous amount of memory per session. And if you add parallelism into this, obviously that can multiply this again, right? But what's even scarier is, let's say we have a much bigger working size, right? So same four gig, but now we have a 3.8 and we have an 18 gig table that I'm gonna to join together, right? So this takes a lot longer to run because one of them can sort in memory, but the other had to spill to disk, right? And so this took, 55 seconds to run in total. So that takes a much longer time. But the bad part was, this is the pink line, right? That's how long I held on to almost nine gig of RAM, right? For almost a full minute. So because it was slow because it had to go to disk, but I also had a big working set, so uh, work mem, it consumed a lot of RAM, right? So if someone did this to your system and you only have a few gigs left on your system, this is going to definitely destabilize your database, right? So these are things you really have to like, you know, watch. So there's been some nice improvements. And one of them is the hash mem multiplier. So hash sorts um, use maintenance work mem, or uh, work mem, sorry, uh, much like everything else. But the problem is you typically benefit a lot to have more RAM for, for hash joins. But if you set your work mem really high, then if you have other sorting or other things in your operation, you might now get to very high use, right? So now you can use the hash mem multiplier to basically get more RAM for hash joining without increasing the risk for work mem. So in this case, I have the hash mem multiplier set to two, which is the default, and I have my work mem set to one gig. So I do my first one, and you probably can't see that. Sorry, it's a bit small. Um, but I do eight batches, right? So I had to chop it up, worked fine, took about uh, 27 seconds to run. Now, if I reverse this and I set the multiplier to one and the working set size to two, guess what? I get the exact same result because that's how the multiplier works. It just double, like if you set it to two, it doubles the, the thing, right? So for this one, then I said, well, okay, I'm still doing eight batches. What if I set the multiplier to eight and keep my work mem at two, right? That way I'm not risking my system by setting my work mem to 16 gig, right? And I can actually get one batch and a much faster time. So now I've got a 75% reduction in how long that hash join took, but I didn't increase the risk on my system by setting my work mem larger and possibly having it blow up, right? There's also some interesting per session items that stick around um, when you create a session. And one example of this is a prepared statement. So if you go and say, prepare this you know, plan, and you have this select, right? What it's gonna do is it's actually gonna go allocate RAM in your session, right? And until you clean up your session, it's going to be there. So in this case, I did three different prepares and you can see each of them are using 4K, right? That doesn't sound like that much, but it can add up, right? And and it, it can allocate RAM very quickly. So we had a customer once who accidentally was 
running prepared statements, but they were generating unique statements for every statement. Um, and so this is essentially like a graph of what happened there was, uh, you know, you get 10 million prepared statements. And if you can look at that time, that only takes about uh, five minutes to prepare 10 million statements. And it used around almost 85 gig of RAM on the box, which caused the database to crash, obviously, right? And you're saying to yourself, well, yeah, Grant, like we're not going to have that 10 million statements, right? But if you imagine that you have a thousand clients, because remember, this is one client. If you have a thousand clients that have 10,000 prepared statements each, you're still going to have a lot of RAM use for prepared statements, right? If you use prepared statements, one of the best things I can tell you is to make sure you're cycling your connections. So if you have a connection pool or whatever, so that you're every once in a while, you're trying to like drain those and rebuild them so that you get rid of some of this bloat that happens, right? So it's just a thing to be careful about if you use prepared statements. So the other big area for, you know, use of RAM is sort of maintenance. And this is things like index builds, right? Or rebuilds. So now we have maintenance work mem. It's essentially work mem, but now for maintenance operations, right? So set maintenance work mem to one gig here. I built this index. I set it to two gig, I built the index. I set it to three gig, built the index. What you'll notice here is that the time was almost exactly the same, right? And you're like, but why? Like it's, these, these are big indexes. Why aren't you getting some benefit? Well, remember that we're backing this with the file system cache. So even though we have to spill to disk for these things when we run out of maintenance work, ma'am, well, the file system cache is caching those blocks. So we get to read them in very quickly out of memory. So depending on your system, setting your work mem super large may not actually benefit you and just put you at more risk. So you really need to test this depending on what, what, what your configuration is like. But in some, you definitely don't want it to be too small, but making it too large doesn't necessarily help. The other major use of work mem, maintenance work mem is vacuuming. Um, and I separate vacuuming from auto vacuuming because it has its own parameter that I'll talk about in a second. So Here's a like high level of how vacuum works in terms of this, right? The first thing vacuum does is scan the heap. And, you know, there's there's maps to help it do that efficiently, but it's looking to collect all the TIDs, basically the tuple IDs of the stuff that needs to be cleaned up, the dead ones, right? And that's what's stuck in maintenance work mem. So if you have maintenance work mem set to a gig, then you can have a gig worth of this. If you have it set to 10 meg, you can have 10 meg worth of uh, things. And then it's going to do scan the index. So if you have too many TIDs that they won't fit in that uh, green box, then you're gonna have to do multiple index scans. And that can be very expensive, right? So how to think about this, and there's some changes in 17. So you'll notice I say this is version 12 through 16. I mean, it applies to the older releases, but I'm really hoping no one's running older releases, right? Everyone's upgrading, right? Good. Um, so I have a 500 million row table, right? And I just updated the entire table because, you know, that's something I do. <laughs> um, I set my maintenance work mem to 200 meg. And what happens is I end up with 15 index scans, right? Because I didn't all fit. And how you can think about this from a calculation perspective is the memory use is six bytes per dead item. And that's, you're using four bytes for the block address and then four bytes or two bytes for the offset, right? So. 500 million times six bytes is, you know, essentially almost three gig of RAM that I needed. But my maintenance work RAM was only set to 200 meg, right? So I need to do lots of passes. So this would have taken quite a while to run. So let's go set the maintenance work RAM to three gig, right? Because that's what I need. So I did that, run the same command, but I ended up with three scans. So why is that? Well, as it turns out, in versions up to 16, Postgres would let you set this parameter higher, but it never used more than a gig of RAM for vacuuming, right? So you can set this to whatever you want. It doesn't matter, you get a gig. Um, so we still needed three gig. We only got a gig, not great, right? So yeah, it only uses a gig. So now on 17, and I say 17 plus, cause it'll apply to well, future versions, I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't think we're going backwards. Um, so I update those same 500 million rows, right? On this table on 17, I have a maintenance work mem to 200 meg, right? And look at this, three scans instead of 15, right? Much better. And why is that? 
Well, the memory use now for 17 is quite a bit different. It uses four bytes for the block and then does a bitmap for the offsets. So it's way more space efficient if you have lots of tuples that are dead in a block, right? So we actually only needed to use four to 600 meg on this one to get the exact same vacuuming done, right? So it was a 5x reduction in memory used by vacuum in 17 for this example. I think it's like one of the biggest features to me that's in the 17 release. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite exciting to me, at least, as someone that, you know, deals with vacuuming. Um, so, but just to show you like why you have to think about this a little bit, cause it's not just straightforward that it's always going to help you. Um, let's go back to 16 again, and I'm going to do the same update, but in this case, I'm doing a slightly weird thing. And I don't know if you guys can read this. Um, I'm using basically the tuple identifier to try to only update like a few, um, tuples in each block, right? So I want to touch basically every block, but I only want to update a few of the tuples instead of all the tuples in every block. So in this case, I updated 58 million rows. Still have my work memory set to 200 meg. And notice that we got it done in two passes, right? Because I only have 58 million tuples at a vacuum, six bytes each. I only needed 224 meg, right? So let's see what 17 does. Now, how many people think 17 is going to be better at this? A few people? Well, you'd be wrong. Uh, it's not. Um, because I'm touching all the blocks in this example, right? So I'm doing that same update, but that update updates at least a tuple in every block, which means the amount of memory I need is almost exactly the same as what I needed when I updated all the tuples because of how I did that update, right? So same maintenance work mem, still three passes, and I'm still needing between 400 and 600 meg, right? So did less updates. So what that tells you is that the 17 stuff can give you a lot of benefit, but it depends on how your dead items are spread across your blocks. So just to illustrate this, I have two workloads. So workload A and workload B. Workload A is updating all over the place in lots of different blocks. Workload B is updating all in just like a new set of blocks, right? Sort of an append kind of model, right? So for version 16, I'm gonna need six times six, right? Because I got six dead tuples. So I need 36 bytes, right? I also need 36 bytes in workload B, right? On workload A, I need four bytes times four blocks, right? Because I updated four blocks that I have to clean up and, the, and plus for the bitmaps for the offset, right? But on workload B, I only need one block needs to be vacuumed, right? So I only need one by four. So this is where you can see if you can keep your vacuuming to sort of a smaller number of blocks now with 17, this is where you're going to get the maximum benefit out of the change to, to, this, to this change. The other thing that's really nice about 17 is it now allows it to use more than one gig. So here I have that vacuum again. I set it to one gig and I have a, I basically took that same table and I rebuilt it with a, a fill factor of 10% to make it very large, right? Um, so I needed five index scans to get this done. And I used, like I said, between four and six or five and six gig at this fill factor, right? So it worked pretty well, but I still would like to get down to one pass, right? So let's go set it up to, oh, I forgot to copy this. Oh, sorry. The, I have the wrong thing. So when I set it to the three gig, what happened was I got down to a single pass. I'm sorry that that actually is wrong, the, the last piece. Um, it actually uses more than one gig. Uh, it can actually use as much as you need. and you can get single passes now done even on very large tables. So that's the other big uh, change, right? So before, if you'd gotten something really out of hand on a bloat, you were going to have to make multiple index pass scans because you just couldn't use more RAM. Now, if you have the RAM, you can use it. So. The other major change from version 16 to 17 is how the memory is allocated, right? So here, what I want to show you is, I did 50 table vacuums in parallel. So this is just like P SQL vacuum command. It's not like auto vacuum or anything, but I only had a 5 million row table and I only updated like 10% of those tables. So I don't need a lot of RAM, but I set the maintenance work mem to one gig. So what happens is that orange line is the version 16 and it allocated almost 12 gig of RAM to do this vacuum. 
across these 50 ones, right? The blue line is version 17, and it used 300 meg. Version 17 now more incrementally allocates the memory as it needs it. So it's safer to set a larger maintenance work mem because if it doesn't need it, it won't actually do big allocations, right? So this means you can more safely set maintenance work mem to a larger number, which means you can do less passes and have more efficient vacuuming. Um, the other uh, piece that people ask me about is vacuum parallelism. Um, so if you do something where you launch, you set the parallel feature, so you're doing multiples, you'll see it says four index vacuuming, right? And what that means is in our little diagram, it's this piece of the work is done in parallel. So it's doing multiple indexes at once, right? But that doesn't really affect the memory usage because that green box for the TIDs is really about how much memory is used. Obviously, you'll have some more processes because there's parallelism, but it doesn't generally change how much memory you need. The one that does change how much memory you need is for auto vacuum work mem. It's the same as maintenance work mem for auto vacuum. But remember, you have auto vacuum maximum workers, right? So if you have a lot of tables and you have this configured for um, a lot, you know, so if you have one gig for your auto vacuum work mem and you have 30 workers configured, if you have 30 tables that all need to be vacuumed at the same time that the auto vacuum thinks about, you'll end up using 30 gig, right? Possibly all at once. So again, this can really destabilize your system. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. So again, the whole point of the talk is to think about what's important in your system to cache, what you, where you need to use your RAM and kind of try to use it effectively without ever getting yourself into the point where you've run out of RAM, because then you're going to have a very destabilized system. And one of the challenges with a destabilized system is actually diagnosing it because they typically get so bad that it's hard to figure out what's causing the problem. So it's much easier if you just, if you have small problems, you can be like, oh, I just need to adjust things a little bit. But if you get into this kind of horrible state, then it becomes really difficult to figure out. So with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Got a few minutes, I think, for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. Yes. How would you recommend monitoring the page map size? Because if it's going to consume a lot of memory, I think yep. it's something we should monitor. What's the best metric to be looking at? Uh, there is a, it's uh, a good question. I, I remember like getting hit. I'm like, I know it's one of the, um, it's in one of the proc. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. And the kernel proc. Yeah. yeah standard proc thing. Yeah. You can just see how much memory is being used for the page table. So yeah, it's, yeah. I can't remember what the name of it is at the moment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. In the back. We're trying to spread out as much as possible to make him run just as <laughs> and then back to the front oh, random right. access uh you can uh, inspect if you use the prometheus node export you can view the page table okay cool yep. didn't know that it's good any other questions oh there we go uh, if you have long running sessions with a lot of prepared statements, <clears throat> so a large part of this memory could be swapped out, probably. Yeah. In that case, is it useful to have more than two gigs of swap? Yeah, except for, of course, if it needs to be swapped back in at some point, like that's the challenge is it's like if it's never going to be used again, then you're better off recycling the session than having swap in that case, right? Um, because the danger about having too much swap stuff swapped out is that if it gets demanded back in all at once, your system is basically just going to halt, but come to a fairly screeching, you know, okay, painful thing. Yeah. So do you have any tips of configuring the memory over commit and over commit route here for the VM? Yeah, I mean, the memory overcommit stuff is, I'm trying to remember what our, our current thinking on that is. Um, yeah, I I don't have anything offhand of what I, I know we've had discussions about it multiple times, and there are some trade-offs there. 
So do you think it's like uh, more likely to restrict the memory, so disable the overcommit, or? Yeah, I mean, the the problem with disabling overcommit is that, like, then you get sort of violent, like, failure. It depends on, you know, what you're trying to achieve, right? And for us, because we run service, right, and the customer doesn't quite have as much direct control, like, we try to make it so that things slow down a bit and give the customer a chance to sort of correct before violently like anything bad happening, right? But it depends on your application because some people would say, look, I'd rather have my application performing perfectly and then crashing and then starting back up than sort of slowly degrading. So it kind of depends on what's more important to you. And I mean, it's always one of the challenges with any database thing, right? Is it sort of cost latency trade-offs. I mean, RAM is all about that, right? Like you can run a database without RAM, it's going to possibly be cheaper, but it's not going to be very latency sensitive, right? So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi. Um, so my question is regarding the um, the comparison that you have with the uh, the one with the like vanilla Postgres setup with the file system cache and everything yeah. and the Aurora. So. As you mentioned, the downside with having a much larger shared buffer and a smaller file system cache is that in case of a you know a crash, you pull everything back from disk yeah. because you lose a shared buffer. Yeah. But would it be an ideal setup to also have that same setup wherein you have a smaller file system cache if you're using a multi-AZ structure because you're basically going to just fail over anyway? Yeah, so to some degree, that yeah, if you're failing from one box to another in those kind of situations, then yeah, you're gonna lose your cache most likely anyway, depending on like, again, classic RDS uses a cold secondary. So in that case, there is no shared buffers, but if it's a Postgres replica, then you may have stuff in cache over there, right? So then it's it's different again, um, but mostly it's, you know, the thing is failovers are good and they're effective, but they're still slower than typically just restarting the process on the box, like if something fails, I've always had people tell me like, hey, if it fails, why not just fail over to another box? And I said, well, one, it may not solve the problem. You may just end up crashing over there 30 seconds later, right? Which is not great. But yeah, I mean, typically like when we do like patching or anything else, we do that locally because it's still faster. Uh, but having the cache survive is a thing, right? So, and then, you know, to be clear, right? With the coming of direct IO and asynchronous on Postgres, I'm guessing Postgres is going to look a lot more like the 75% no file system thing at some point in the future, because uh, that's kind of the direction all the databases have went with direct IO, right? So, cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the conference.